I'm uh, Deborah. I'm from the uh, Montreal IS. And uh, today's meeting is um, Marxism and Anarchism. Uh, James Clark will be speaking for us. James is with the uh, York University International Socialist. Um, he's going to be speaking for about 35 minutes. And, but there's going to be plenty of time for uh, discussion afterwards. Uh, so if, you have any, if you're thinking of anything you'd like to talk about, make a note or just keep it in mind and bring it up during discussion. So I'll let you uh, begin. Okay, thanks Deborah, and thanks to everybody uh, for coming to this session. So I'm gonna start off by talking a little bit about the radicalization of recent years. I think that's the context for any kind of discussion about activism or resistance in the movements, and in particular, what we would call anarchism and Marxism, and what we want to see is the differences, as well as what, what's in common. So in the last few years, as you've probably been talking about in many uh, sessions here at the Marxism Conference, there has been an impressive wave of radicalization that has swept the world. Um, you can think about what happened in Wisconsin in early 2011 when there were tens of thousands of people who mobilized against the austerity laws, the attacks on the right to organize. You saw trade unionists and their supporters mobilizing to occupy the Capitol in Madison, the Capitol building in Madison, Wisconsin. At the same time, there was this massive process that was beginning in the Arab world, which has since come to be known as the Arab Spring, a process that didn't necessarily begin in late 2010 or early 2011, one that was certainly bubbling for years before that, but one that became obvious and burst onto the scene in 2011. And that's a process that continues to this day. And I'm sure there are many people here who were, like me, <coughs> watching your laptops or your, your whatever, trying to get access to what was happening in Tahrir Square. Suddenly there's interest in Al Jazeera, people who just want to know up to the minute information about all these mobilizations. And following from the Arab Spring, you saw a wave of mobilizations and radicalizations in other parts of the world. And I think the most quickly, uh, what came most quickly on the heels of the Arab Spring were the indignados, Los Indignados in Spain, when over a hundred uh, towns and cities, the central squares, were occupied. Uh, the same mobilizations, the massive anti-austerity mobilizations in Greece, Portugal, and then finally in North America, we had the Occupy movement, where you had Occupy Wall Street that started in the fall of that year, and then that spread to about, I think, 1,700 cities around the world that were encampments or occupations, but certainly mobilizations, not just against this particular issue or that particular issue, but in many cases against the entire system in general. There were these generalized mobilizations and oppositions against capitalism in general. There was a recognition that the system itself was the problem. And so all of those mobilizations that I've just mentioned, or, or, or I hope we'll have a chance to talk about in this discussion, represented the radicalization of millions, uh, maybe more, of ordinary people around the world, not just activists or people who identify as the left or a socialist or anarchist or whatever, but this was a mobilization of regular, everyday, ordinary people who are beginning to criticize the system, who are beginning to make the links from one issue to another, and who are saying, you know what, there is something wrong with the entire way we organize, and maybe there is an alternative, maybe there is something else we can do about it. And I, the litmus test for me is when my brother, who's a pharmacist, called me up and says, can you talk to me for like 20 minutes about what's happening with Occupy? Why are people in this park? And did that really happen with the bailouts? Did, did the banks really get all that money from the government? And there were lots of people like that who were just furious and this is how the system happened. So this is the context for the kind of discussion that we're having today. What is the radicalization that is seeing literally millions of people around the world want to talk about the alternatives to capitalism and the possibility of building a better world? Now it's in this context that I think there is a very understandable appeal for anarchist ideas, and not just in this moment, but in other moments of radicalization. And again, we can look at other periods in history when anarchist ideas became very popular, moments of resistance to capitalism or the system where these ideas uh, emerged and uh, became widespread amongst uh, ordinary people. Now, what are some anarchist ideas? Um, in general, and I'll speak in the, in the broadest sense here, and I'll certainly invite our anarchist friends in the room to elaborate on this in this discussion, but in general, I think anarchist ideas represent a blanket rejection of the state and all forms of authority, of corrupt parliamentary politics and bourgeois or mainstream elections, and of self-serving political parties and politicians 
And I think those are all good things that we want to reject, especially when you think of uh, why so many of these movements emerged and what they're organizing against. Of course, we endorse that and celebrate that and share that kind of uh, opposition to that kind of authoritarianism. And I think the the spirit and enthusiasm that comes from a lot of activists who come to identify themselves as anarchists builds our confidence and builds the confidence of the wider public that another system is possible, right? That we don't have to live this way. And there's certainly a liberatory quality to anarchist politics. People are just completely defiant. They do not want to accept that the status quo is the only thing that's possible. So that's something that we want to connect with. Yeah. I think there are other historical and political reasons why anarchist ideas are popular. I think they have to do with the vacuum, the political vacuum that has been left by, on the one hand, the older social democratic parties. Right? There have been lots of discussions this weekend about how the traditional parties of the left, right, the Labour Party, social democracy, have shifted to the right, have abandoned their working class roots, or sort of more social liberal parties. So that. Um, that, on the one hand, has created a political vacuum. And then certainly the end of the Cold War with the disappearance of the, you know, the big C communist parties um, that at one time had huge influence. They had massive influence on the left and struggles and trade unions. There were lots of young people and activists who would gravitate to those parties. And so their being discredited over the years has meant that there's a political vacuum and it has been filled by um, a lot of anarchist ideas. And representing a rejection uh, reaction uh, to the progressive incorporation of once radical traditions into the corrupt world of official politics. Right? So as you see those alternatives just get sucked into the project of neoliberalism, of, of the system, anarchist ideas are going to flourish. Now what I would suggest here for our discussion, we can sort of put this off to the side and come back to it later on, is that there is a limit to anarchist ideas. So and I don't think um, that it is necessarily a barrier to working together and we want to organi organize around uh, common struggles, but I think the limit of anarchist ideas is that they don't necessarily translate into an effective strategy to challenge capitalism, the state, or the overall system, and that's what I want to I want to get into. Now, what are the key features of anarchism? Um, first, there's many kinds of anarchisms, right? We don't want to like, homogenize it and say there's one big monolithic thing that it always does this or always there isn't one sort of anarchist go-to person who says this is all the stuff we do for anarchism, right? There's a variety of anarchism. So you have uh, individualist anarchism, right? Largely rejects all forms of organization. You have anarchists who rely on concepts of the people, right? Or regardless of, of class divisions. You have what some people say is uh, a contradiction, but communist anarchists who rely on the working class or orient to the working class. Uh, anarchism comes out of the, the idea of the peasant band and the tradition of Nestor uh, Makhno, right? A, a Ukrainian anarchist. You have anarchism that opposes trade unionism. You have anarcho-syndicalism, which relies on trade unionism, and all kinds of varieties of, uh, of anarchisms within that. Some of it revolutionary, some of it actually terrorist, some of it pacifist, some of it green. Um, but all of them are influenced to some degree or other by the ideas of uh, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, uh, Mikhail Bakunin is a big name, Peter Kropotkin, uh, um, and there are others that we'll hear about, uh, I'm sure, in the discussion. But if we could just boil that down, maybe to some basic talking points, just for the purposes of discussion, I would suggest that there are maybe four defining features that would unite uh, anarchists of all political stripes. And they are, one, hostility to the state in all its forms, and that includes the idea of a revolutionary state. Uh, hostility to leadership in all its forms, including the idea of revolutionary leadership. And we'll have some discussion about what we mean by leadership. Mm -hmm. Hostility to political parties, including the idea of a revolutionary party. And the fourth one I'd say is a tendency to individualism over collective action and organizing. So those are just, in broad strokes, four defining uh, characteristics that would probably unite anarchists of all kinds of political uh, persuasions and, and traditions. Now let's go through those one by one. The state. First up, what do we mean by the state? Because people use that term all the time when we talk about politics and you know smashing the state. What exactly is the state? And I'd argue it's not just the government, right? The people who get elected every four years, the MPs who sit in parliament, but it's all the unelected institutions that make up the infrastructure of a country, right? So the courts, the so-called justice system, the police, the prisons, the military, all the government agencies and departments, the civil service, the state bureaucracy. This is the state, and none of these things, except for the parliament on some 
uh, on some moderate level. None of these things are accountable to elections, right? A lot of the people who occupy the space of the state or who, who function in those places, they don't get elected, they're there, uh, they're appointed, or and they're there from in between elections from one time to another. So that's generally what the state is. Not just the government, but all these institutions that represent the infrastructure of the government. They provide all kinds of services and whatever, but that is what I'd suggest is the state. The literal meaning of anarchy right, is no rule, which translates into opposition to the state and the government. And I would argue that that is at all times, no matter what, as a matter of principle. So this works in the moment that we oppose oppressive capitalist states. I'm sure all of us in this room, regardless of whether we're anarchists or Marxists or whatever, we would oppose the oppressive capitalist state. But what happens when we try to replace oppressive capitalist states? What happens when another kind of state emerges? What is our attitude then? Is it merely on principle that we would refuse to support it because it's a state? That's a question we, we want to get into. And I would suggest that anarchists generally see the existence of any state as oppressive and opposed to the idea of human freedom. Right? So any kind of state, right? any kind of coercive apparatus is opposed to the idea of human freedom. And I would argue that that idea, uh, the idea that only self-governing communities with no central authority uh, is what anarchists would argue would, uh, is what allows true freedom to exist. Right? So there's no central authority, self-governing, uh, voluntary associations. Now, they're half right. I think this argument is half correct um, in the sense that uh, conventional wisdom, right? You think about the you know, ruling class ideas that shape what we think of the state and how the world works. Um, conventional wisdom opposes this idea, and I want to go through a few things. First, there's the typical argument you hear in like school and social studies, right? That without the state, the world would be chaos, right? There's the Thomas Hobbes argument about life being nasty, brutish, and short, unless there's some kind of figure to, uh, or some kind of apparatus to control it and to end chaos. And I think. History shows that that's absolutely false, right? For the vast majority of time that human beings have existed, and some people say that our species is, you know, 100,000 years old, and that maybe it's in the last 10, five to 10,000 years that class society has emerged in a way that it's 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 really uh, coercive. So you look at the existence of humans on a biological scale, the vast majority of that time there hasn't been that coercive apparatus. So I think that demonstrates that that argument is false. There's also the idea that human nature is evil, right? That we're inherently evil, and this is what leads to the necessity of having this coercive apparatus to check uh, our being evil. And I think, again, that history shows that the vast majority of human history is that we actually cooperate, right? By necessity, we are social beings, and we've had to, um, we've had to cooperate and, and work together just to survive, right? Um, so anarchists are right absolutely right, to oppose these kinds of bourgeois or mainstream or middle class ideas that are, are about denying the possibility of agency or changing the world. But what the limit is of this idea is that there is no strategy to confront or overthrow the state that we oppose, which limits the effectiveness of anarchist ideas in long term struggles. And I would suggest again that sometimes a common practice among anarchists, it's not all anarchists, but generally a common practice, uh, in response to the state is to organize outside of it or to make the argument that it is possible to organize around it in communes and collectives uh, by how you live your life, right? what kind of lifestyle you adopt. Uh, and the reality is that only a very small number of people can do this. Right? We, we, when we th want to think about how do we oppose the state or want to get rid of it, we want to think in terms of mass politics. What kind of strategies can we deploy that can attract the vast majority of ordinary people who can be part of that project of their own liberation? And the problem is that if you reduce that project to what you do in your lifestyle, to how you live your life, it limits who uh, can be a part of it. It's also a problem to sustain it, right? Like how do you sustain a project when some small numbers of people adopt that kind of lifestyle? Does it challenge the way the state operates and how it affects all our lives? Now, by contrast, what Marxists would say is that, you know, we need to think about how to get rid of the state, and the argument is we get rid of the state by revolution. Right? Now, that's no easy task, but generally, the idea of revolution is, at least a Marxist uh, think about revolution, is a process in which the working class, and we have a discussion about who and what the working class is, but in which the working class takes direct action against the state, destroying its core institutions and creating new forms of government in its place. Now, this is not taking the same as taking control of the state, right? We just came from a session. Uh, well, there was a session at lunchtime, we talked about the NDP and electoralism. It's not the same as just getting all the right people in the right place at the right time to suddenly take control of the levers of the state and just kind of 
uh, tinker with the edges. This is something entirely different. We want to smash the state, right? When you talk about the slogan, like getting rid of all those coercive and oppressive institutions. But the question is, how do you do that? Like, what happens in the process between smashing the existing capitalist state and getting to that long-term goal that I think everybody would share, regardless of their political perspective, which is that society of, of, uh, of self-organization, of voluntary association, of equality, of freedom and justice, those sorts of things. What is the process, or what is the stage, or, or the period, or the, or the experience that unfolds between the moment of smashing the state and getting to something else? Um, and this is, this is not just a pipe dream, right? There's all kinds of historical examples we can talk about. The Paris Commune of 1871, right? When the poor people and, and, and workers in Paris rose up and, and for three months created um, a radically democratic society, um, or at least a glimpse of what that could be. And then, of course, the Russian Revolution in 1917, which um, we'll, we'll come back to. So I think the question is, when we have a discussion about smashing the state, is can we move directly to a classless society in which there is no form of authority whatsoever? And I think the obvious answer is no. And so the question is, what can we draw from anarchist theory and practice that talks about this and that avoids creating new forms of power or states? And I think the obvious problem that if you look at the Arab Spring right, and what's happening in Egypt, for example, right, where ordinary people <coughs> have risen up against First they get rid of Mubarak, but then months later, like, you know what, the same state exists. All the same players are still there, right? And so now they're raising the same slogans against the new people, right? It's not just this one figure, it's the whole system, right? And it's a process of radicalization that people are going through. So we know the old ruling class is not just going to walk away, right? It's like, oh, all these people have turned up to say they want to, they want to control what they produce. Oh, well, sure, we'll let, it, we'll let you have it. That's never going to happen. Uh, and in fact, anything they lose, they're going to organize to get that back, right? We can see that through, you know, the whole history of counter-revolutions. And again, the Arab Spring is instructive. Um, but in order to make that transition, a new economic order must be created uh, that coordinates all the activity of work, worker-occupied workplaces and factories and anywhere people organize to produce wealth. How do we coordinate that? We need some kind of mechanism to coordinate that and distribute the wealth and to share it. Uh, never mind the fact that many people will still rely on the state for support. Right? Think about the, the services that the state currently provides and what people will need in the absence of that. Will it help smashing the state if it means the end of health care right? for ordinary people or for benefits or social housing or whatever? What, what does that mean on, uh, on a practical level uh, when you want to smash the state? Um, and then there's the question of it's not going to be the case that everybody is going to agree to follow the majority's decisions, right? Like, who is the majority, right? And we're going to need some kind of revolutionary state to defend and impose those decisions, right? Which is like holding down a picket line, right? So what is a picket line, right? When people vote by the majority to go on strike, and they say that we have democratically discussed the debate and decided we're going to shut down this workplace, and no one's going to get in, right? And when you say to a scab, you're not going to get in a workplace, that is coercive. You're saying we're enforcing the decision. We're imposing the democratic will of the majority on somebody who does not want to respect that. Right? And so on some level, how does that translate on a revolutionary level to a revolutionary state? And it's basically, what do we do to hold each other accountable? And that's the key thing, to see the radical potential of a new state that is distinct from the old state. We want to see a state where workers have the power to hold each other accountable, but also to impose the will of the immense majority. Another question that I mentioned at the beginning that uh, defines, in, in broad terms, uh, the idea of anarchism is hostility to leadership. And I think anarchists are quite right to reject the idea of leadership because there are so many shitty examples. And we could spend this whole session just talking about it. Uh, first one, you've got the right-wing examples, right? So you've got you know, the elitist ideas, privilege, access, like Mike Duffy, right? <laughs> That's apparently leadership. Right? And so leadership is such a bad word now. It's like when the Tories get caught stealing and lying and they grudgingly a week later decide to pay it back, they call that leadership. Duffy is... We want to, yeah, we want to congratulate Mike Duffy for showing real leadership. He got caught, he's going to pay it back. That's leadership. Like, no wonder people are like, I don't want everything to do with this. And you've got left-wing examples of shitty leadership, right? So you've got trade union bureaucrats who will sell out strikes for whatever reason. And there's a whole other discussion about what's the difference between the rank and file and the bureaucracy. You've got uh, social democratic leaders who are not necessarily interested in supporting the struggle. It's all about containing it, running to the front of it, right? 
getting a solution in the parliamentary way. And then if you look at the broader history of, of communist struggles, you can look at the role of the Communist Party, right, influenced by Stalinism and the role that the party, the party played in demobilizing massive mobilizations, right. And May 68 in France is one of the best examples where the French Communist Party uh, was actually trying to create barriers between radicalizing youth and trade unionists because they were losing control of the mobilization, right. And they wanted uh, an outcome that was satisfactory to uh, the interests of Russian foreign policy more than uh, anything else. Um, but the reality is that leadership is a fact. Right? Leadership is a fact in any kind of struggle, and it's not something that we can just dispense with. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about how does leadership work in you know, everyday situations. So you have, like, you know, you're at a university lecture, right? Somebody who puts up their hand to disagree with the prof, that's an example of leadership, right? So I'm going to take initiative and say, no, I don't agree with this, right? So it's a gesture to say, I'm going to lead an argument on this. Others might follow, right? What about an accident, right? There's an accident on the side of the road. The decision to pull over to help someone with a flat tire, right, or to mobilize other people or to stop traffic is an example of leadership, right? A workplace situation, right? The boss is picking on someone, and you know somebody will say, "Can you back off or leave this person alone or to stand up?" But that's an example of taking leadership. Um, a demonstration or a riot or something like you know a political event where somebody makes a decision <coughs> to say we're not going to back off, right? Or, or somebody gives a speech and says the police are wrong, we're not going to give ground, right? These are all examples of leadership that have an outcome on what happens in, in all these situations. So, so leadership is something that exists and there's all kinds of reasons why people might feel confident to be leaders and not confident to be leaders, right? There are material reasons for that, right? Access to knowledge, courage, what people feel at a particular moment, but leadership exists. And actually Trotsky, Leo Trotsky, the Russian revolutionary, had a really interesting thing to say about leadership, which is that in any situation, if you reduced a group of people to five people, right? Imagine we could reduce this room to five people. There's going to be one person, well hopefully not in this meeting, but uh, in general there's going to be one person who's a right winger, who's going to always side with the boss, who's going to you know, always be on the side of the oppressor. There's going to be one person who always stands up for justice and who fights for the underdog and who will fight against oppression. And there'll be three people in the middle who could go either way. They don't necessarily, they're not, you know, not wedded to one perspective or another. And what leadership means is taking responsibility for those arguments and trying to win the three away from that one right winger. Right? That's all leadership is. Right? It's like trying to put things forward that you don't impose on people, but that you win people to. Right? So that's, that's the idea of leadership, and I think what, what we want to do is not deny that leadership exists, but think about how do we make it accountable. And denying that it exists it actually does make it impossible to hold it accountable, because leaders self-select or self-perpetuate. Right? People rise to the occasion for different reasons, and we want to make sure that there's a way to keep that accountable. The other reality is that there are many forces in class society that are trying to lead or influence the working class, right? Social Democrats, right? The NDP, capitalist parties, the ruling class, and so on, right? There, are, there is a fight for leadership, right? So if we avoid the idea of leadership, we concede this ground. Is that 10 minutes have passed or our left? Left? Okay. Are we going for the 40-minute talk or the 30-minute talk? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, 35. Okay. So if, if we back away from the idea of leadership, then we cede that territory to other people who are going to fill the vacuum and who are going to lead it, right? So that's why it's important that we want to take the idea of leadership seriously. But the question of leadership or the problem of leadership or the solutions of those problems is to come up with an accountable kind of leadership. One that's democratic, right? So under the control of, of supporters. One that's resistant to corruption in the system around us. And one that's able to identify the best way forward, right? So what do we mean by the best way forward? It's, it's trying to articulate or give expression to a certain set of ideas that allow people to navigate difficult situations, right? So we don't repeat the, his, the, the mistakes of the past, and we can learn from the successes of the past. That's all that it's trying to do, is put forward ideas and win people to those ideas, not imposing it on it. You never win if you oppose it on people. You need to win it. And so that's what I think revolutionary leadership is about. Now, related to that is the question of a revolutionary party. And again, just as there are many... Uh, examples of, of bad leadership. There are many examples of uh, bad parties from social democracy, from uh, the role of the communist parties, the influence of Stalinism. There is a long history of intervention uh, by these agents or, or, or by these uh, entities in the movements that have not always worked out for the better. They've often sought to demobilize movements because they, they, they thought, you know, it's our job to manage and negotiate this, not yours. We don't want to lose control because then we lose our influence over these longer struggles.
But for those of us who want to fight to change the world and ultimately to challenge capitalism, we know that an organized party or some kind of organization is key to winning the day-to-day -day struggles in the here and now, as well as building the longer-term struggle against the system as a whole. And we don't have to counterpose reform now with revolution in the future. I think that there is a relationship between these two things. We know that our opponents are highly organized and centralized, and so we have to think about how we organize in our ranks to defeat that, to resist that. Uh, and this is, think about a workplace, right? Again, coming back to the idea of a picket line, you can only win if you're organized and act in a united manner, right? Does one person go on strike against the boss, or does the whole workplace go on strike against the boss? And if you had to choose which fight is going to win, it's probably going to be the one where the whole workplace goes on, on strike. The other reason I think that this is important is that political consciousness in the working class right, is uneven. Right? We know that the power of capitalist ideology and its influence in the media and how workers think uh, has an effect on what we do and on our confidence and our ability to resist. Uh, those who own or control the means of production also own or control the mental means of production that Marx talked about. We're not all brainwashed, right? we're not just empty vessels, but we do grow up with ideas that limit our ability to resist, right? We grow up with racist ideas or sexist ideas or homophobic ideas. All, of idea, all these ideas are meant to divide us, right? And lower our expectations about what we can do to fight back. So it's not that we're just empty vessels where this ideology gets poured in, but it does affect what we, what we think and what we think is possible. Now those who do want to organize, who do want to fight back, for whatever reasons, they, they might come to a higher level of consciousness because they might have been through a radicalizing experience, or they might have had access to these ideas, but it's not an elitist thing. It's not like people are born radicals, right? Or are, are born revolutionaries. Um, it's through our own experience. And so those who have come to those conclusions uh, need to organize together, uh, especially if you come to the conclusion that it's not just we need to reform capitalism, we need to get rid of it all together. And so the question is, how do we unite in an organization to coordinate that activity and learn from each other's experiences? Some people say, you know, our party's bound to become corrupt, right? Isn't it inevitable that all these organizations become corrupt? But again, this is the, that old human nature argument that, uh, you know, very mainstream argument that would ultimately rule out the possibility of anarchism, right? If you believe that, right? That if you think that just organizing is going to lead to corruption, then anarchism is, you know, by human nature is going to be impossible. And then, of course, there's the argument about uh, democratic centralism, right? Isn't that undemocratic, right? And I think it's actually the opposite. It's the fullest application of democracy, right? So if we made a vote in here and the vast majority of us decided that, you know, it's freezing cold outside and we're going to close the windows, but one person says, you know what, I object to this, I want to block it. What's democratic about one person saying that everybody has to go by this one decision? It doesn't mean we have to make that decision permanent. Maybe it's going to get warm in here, we have to open the window again. But we have the discussion, right? We create the space for discussion and debate. In fact, this is one of the things that made the Quebec student strike so effective is that there was such a sense of democratic centralism in the assemblies that you actually had people who were the carré vert, people who favored the, the, the hike in tuition fees, who felt compelled to enforce the picket lines because they lost the debate. They thought, you know, we participate in the general assemblies, we lost the debate, it's now our job to implement the decision of the majority. So you had people who were opponents of the strike on the picket line saying you will not access the university because there was such a tradition of democratic centralism that it was only fair and democratic to implement uh, those ideas. Now the last thing, I'll, I'll just uh, come to the role of the individual in society before we'll look at a few moments of, of uh, anarchism and struggle, is one, you get the Stalinist view of the individual, right? We often talk about, uh, in, in a, broadly speaking, anarchist ideas are much more sympathetic to the individual over the collective. In some reasons, there's a legitimate reaction to this because you have a caricature, right, from Stalinism that any sense of the individual is somehow bourgeois, right, or um, uh, it's, it's, it's opposed to the interests of the collective. And that's not at all what Marx was talking about. Uh, in fact, he argued that the individual could only thrive in the context of the collective, right, by satisfying all the basic needs of existence. And in truth, there's never been any time in history when an individual could just do as he or she pleases. Never, right? Even at times when states didn't exist, everybody had to help out somehow, right? So if people didn't help out with a collective labor of producing food or shelter or clothing or whatever, they were often excluded from the group, which in some cases meant death, right? If you didn't work with the group, then it often meant death. And in fact, language, right? 
is the most collective, cooperative thing, right? We all come here and consent to the words I say and sound will mean a certain thing, right? There's a collective participation in language in order for us to communicate, right? So we are truly social beings on all levels. And finally, the Quebec students also argued this, the success of working class individuals is dependent on the success of the class as a whole, right? Which is why Quebec students had a sophisticated argument that you will not cross our picket line because it will affect the education of all of us. We all win if, if the tuition fees go down or if the hike doesn't go up. And they were confident about that. They said, you might be able to go to a private university and get your education, but not all of us. The success of individual working class students depended on the success of the class as a whole, which is what allowed the strike to be successful. Now, there are three quick examples I'm going to run through here uh, really, really quickly. Um, and maybe I'll just sketch them in broad uh, strokes just so we can uh, have a basis for discussion. But it's examples of anarchism or anarchist ideas at the key moments of struggle. And there are three that I've, I've isolated. There are lots we can talk about, but there's uh, Bakunin that uh, most anarchists have some kind of uh, identification with or have some kind of um, connection to. Um, and one of the most striking examples, I think one of the contrasts between his practice and water collective practices, an action he called in uh, Lyon in France in 1870 as part of the First International. He's actually organizing a secret association of socialist uh, democrats, is what it was called within the First International, that in the course of a massive movement, in the course of a massive struggle, he and other anarchists went to the uh, Cité de Ville in Lyon and declared the abolition of the state. They just declared it and took over the city hall. Of course, the French state had other ideas and marched in the troops and shut it down. And he had to flee to Genoa. And actually, when the Paris Commune happened a year later in 1871, he was completely absent from one of the most celebrated instances of workers' uh, resistance and power. Um, I don't want to reduce Bakunin's experience to that, but it's an interesting contrast between what collective and individual actions mean. Uh, the Russian Revolution, right? Probably the most important political event of the 20th century, despite what disagreements we may have on its outcome, but one of the most important political events of the 20th century. Anarchists had very little influence in the Soviets, right? Because they didn't feel it was important to participate in them or to wage the argument amongst the vast majority of workers who saw these new democratic bodies as a place to organize and actually became a space and the vehicle to, uh, to, to replace the existing state. Uh, in Spain, 1936 is probably the, uh, the, the most familiar example. Um, people who have read uh, George Orwell's Homage to Catalonia or have seen um, the film Land and Freedom by Ken Loach have a sense of what an amazing democratic radical movement this was. Um, in 1936, you had a million members of the Spanish uh, trade union, the CNT, which was largely anarchist in its politics. Um, you saw workers rise up in Barcelona and Madrid to defend the popular front government uh, that had been uh, uh, attacked by Franco and the fascists. Um, but the anarchists eventually joined the government uh, in 1936, supporting the demands of the movement and the struggle to the interests of a stable capitalist government, uh, which actually undermined the real movement in the streets against Franco. And we can discuss that in more detail, but ultimately the reason was that they were opposed to imposing, quote unquote, their own ideas on the struggle, which they argued was more unpalatable than joining a bourgeois government, even though a revolution was needed. We can talk about uh, that in more detail in the discussion. What I'll wrap up on are just essentially, I think, two um, popular trends or currents in anarchism that you see today. Um, the first one I'd probably call a default anarchism, right? I think I was a default anarchist in some, some ways when I first radicalized. I was attracted to the ideas of Chomsky. I rejected the state, and it just made sense, right? Until you get confronted with that practical question, okay, you hate, want to get rid of the state, what do you do to get rid of it, right? Is it going to be you and other anarchists, or is it going to be a mass movement of ordinary people? Um, and often popular in sort of default anarchism is what you'd call lifestyle anarchism, where it's you know, how you live your life, where you live your life, who you live with. Um, and the challenge is that it doesn't necessarily pose a challenge to the system, right? Because you can't opt out of the system, right? You can live in a collective or a commune or whatever, but capitalism will continue, climate change will continue, wars will still be prosecuted, exploitation will still exist, right? So the question is how do you begin to, to challenge that? And the question is how do you connect with the real collective power of workers, right? Which is what Marxists orient to. The other one is autonomism, right? Which is actually popular in some Marxist circles. Some people um, who are autonomous also see themselves as part of the Marxist tradition. Where it comes from is uh, Mario Tronti and Antonio, the idea of Mario Tronti 
and uh, Anto Antonio Negri in the 1970s, uh, who came up with what was called the strategy of refusal uh, by workers uh, who were counterposing uh, their activity to trade union activity and political organization. And part of this comes out of the demoralization of the defeat of the long hot autumn in the early 1970s and the failure of mass uh, workers' movements. But the problem with the strategy of refusal is that so counterposed was its activity to trade union organization and political organization that it led to this idea of workerism, which was a refusal to cooperate with wage labor, kind of a moral argument, right, that we're going to refuse to work, kind of unofficial strikes, absenteeism, sabotage, and you end up with this idea of the socialized worker versus wage laborers, right? And there were actually confrontations where trade unions were being attacked by autonomists because they thought that they were, they were the enemy, because they were agreeing to participate in wage labor, right? As you can imagine, the disaster of a strategy where you already there are these so many divisions of the working class, and then you have this radical idea that actually deepens and perpetuates those divisions, and in some cases delivers violence against ordinary workers who are quote unquote complicit in their own oppression. Um, there's lots of interesting debates about platform anarchism, which we can get into a discussion. Uh, two big debates, direct action, right? Should we fetishize a tactic, or do we see it as just that, a tactic, right? When and where do we use direct action, or do we use it all the time, right? And though, that's a debate that certainly exists in the moment around the G8 and G20 in Toronto, right? The idea of diversity of tactics actually wasn't very diverse because it was about enforcing one particular tactic at the same time. This is, might be a bit of a caricature, caricature, but in some debates I was a part of, it was actually, this is the only tactic that works. We're going to use it all the time in every place, even when you decide to use a different tactic. Um, and then the question of participation in elections, right? Should we participate in elections, or does that contribute to uh, the legitimacy of the system? Right? Are we contributing to the legitimacy of the system by participating in elections? And it comes down to the question of, you don't have to have faith in getting elected to change the world, but you have to see it as an arena in which ideas are contested, in which people are looking for a lead, in which people want alternatives. And if you see that ground to the Liberals and the Conservatives and the NDP, then you lose out on a chance to engage people and to win them to new ideas. I'll wrap up now just by saying that um, I certainly welcome uh, the experience of those who identify as anarchists or who are active in the anarchist movement. And I think despite what differences might exist on the question of anarchism and, and Marxism, there's certainly lots more in common in terms of the day-to-day -day struggles we want to be involved in and fighting oppression and, and being part of uh, all kinds of struggles against the system. And hopefully in the course of organizing together and working together, we'll have more time and space to develop uh, these questions and come up with collective solutions. Great. That's it. Thank you.